great pleasure today to uh, host Simone Mattei, who is a team leader here at the EMBL Imaging Center. And I want to give you a brief introduction. So uh, Simone told me just recently, he considers himself very much an Amber product. And this is uh, despite the fact he's Italian and he studied at the University of Rome at La Sapienza. He already joined Amble as a PhD student to work with um, John Briggs on high resolution cryo electron tomography um, and especially on sort of um, studying the HIV-1 uh, mutants. After his PhD at Amble, he transitioned to a postdoc at ETH in Zurich, uh, where again he worked on um, cryo electron, in this case microscopy. And uh, um, here on work, he worked a lot or investigated the Trypanosoma brucei and here, especially the mitochondrial complexes within this uh, parasite. And we are very happy that um, since uh, 2020, he's uh, one of the two team leaders at the Amber Imaging Center, and he is especially responsible for the um, electron and cryo-electron uh, microscopy services, but not only providing service, but also uh, uh, pursuing technology development projects. And I think this is what he will talk to us today, and I'm very much looking forward to your presentation. Please, Simone, you could share your screen, and the floor is yours. Yes. Thank you very much for the kind introduction, Robert, for the invitation. And maybe you can confirm that you see the the slides. Um, in the yes. And the shape. Okay. Fantastic. That's good. So, yeah. Um, uh, thanks again, Robert. And uh, as you as you introduced, um, I have this now dual role. Here at TMBL as team leader, that means uh, I have my um, service team that supports the, the community uh, with external service provision, but we also have our research uh, group affiliated to the Structure and Computational Biology Unit that drives uh, the, the development of workflows, uh, methods, and, and of course, uh, also answer our biology um, uh, questions. And today I would like to give you um, two um, two stories that that provide you an overview of how cryoelectron tomography has developed in the past ten years. We have now asking ten years, and um, and then a new very recent story that we we put online uh, yesterday about the work we are doing in the lab. Um, so um, as Robert said, um, my uh, team is um, is embedded within. The imaging center together with my colleague Timon Zimmerman with the light microscopy team we really strive to um, both provide services but de develop technology and, and workflows for correlative uh, um, electron and light microscopy and the idea is really to be able to bridge uh, all the scales of biology from the full organisms and tissues down down to cellular investigations about morphologies organelles uh, processes uh, to finally understand those biological questions at the molecular level with high resolution uh, structural biology. So to be able uh, to provide forefront uh, and cutting edge services to the community, we, we also have to have our own uh, questions that uh, need to, to, to uh, need a further development to be addressed. So as I told you today, I will, I will show you two stories. Uh, the first one is about uh, HIV-1. Uh, its structure and, and part of, the, of his infection cycle. And the second one will be uh, about um, protein synthesis and, and cellular stress uh, at the mitochondrial level in, in yeast. But uh, let's focus on, on the first part, which, uh, as Robert anticipated, uh, started with uh, my PhD uh, in 2013. And um, very briefly, I think, unfortunately, we are all familiar with this virus, but HIV-1 is the human immunodeficiency virus, is a lengthy virus of the retroviride family, so it's an enveloped virus, it's pleomorphic, the particles are all different uh, from each other, targets the immune system, and this is why it causes the acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. Um, thousands of people, hundreds of thousands of people still die every year, with more than 40 million deaths overall. There is uh, treatments, antiretroviral anti treatments, but no cure to date. So HIV, of course, still remains a major glo uh, global public health issue. And that was uh, the reason uh, to, to um, start my PhD in a structural biology project aimed at understanding 
uh, the maturation process uh, of uh, of each every one. And this, uh, I was hired uh, by John Briggs here at MBL in collaboration with Hans Georg Kreuzlich, professor downtown at Heidelberg University. And um, as a brief introduction to the structure of the virus, uh, HIV um, um, encode the genome encodes for a structured polyprotein called GAG, which is composed of individual domain um, with um, the matrix domain contacting uh, the membrane of, of an infected cell, the capsid domain that is the one that we form this conical uh, shape which encases the genome, the nucleocapsid domain which is the one binding the RNA genome of the virus, and a small P6 domain. And you know, the, the different domains are translated as a polyprotein and uh, that will be then cleaved by the viral protease. Um, and you see here how GAG uh, self-assemble underneath the membrane on, of an infected cell to form this um, incomplete uh, spherical lattice beneath uh, the membrane. The particle then buds and it is an immature particle. So this is uh, not an infectious um, state of the of the viruses, but when the viral protease um, gets activated by dimerization, it will cleave the the, the different the individual uh, domains, release them, and a major structural rearrangement will occur, which is called maturation step. And maturation is what leads to a, a mature, fully infectious uh, virus which is characterized by the presence of this conical capsid, which encases the RNA gene of the virus and, and the replication enzymes. And also we have a surface rearrangement of the glycoproteins uh, on the envelope of the virus. And now this is an infectious virus that can go and, and contact the receptor of another cell and infect it uh, by releasing the conical core in the cytoplasm, which will eventually lead to the integration of the viral genome into the, the one retrotranscription of the viral genome and integration of the retrotranscribed DNA into the genome of the host cell. So, of course, if we are able to uh, understand the maturation process, then we, we can uh, find ways of uh, contracting this mechanism to, to block the, the infection. And as I told you, HIV viruses are pleomorphic, so they're all different from each other. They, they are not amenable by X-ray crystallography or standard cryo-EM single particle analysis to determine their structure. And therefore, the most suitable um, um, technique to date is uh, cryo-electron tomography. And here you see an example of uh, computational models of the uh, immature and mature virus being reconstructed, where you see clearly the GAG lattice map uh, beneath uh, the, the membrane here, and then the conical core after cleavage of the individual domain in case in the, this blob, which is the RNA genome. But how do we get uh, to this point? How do, how do we get those reconstructions? So let me introduce first the technique, uh, so cryogenic electron tomography. Um, we, we start by acquiring cryogenic images of uh, our viruses. And you see that those spheres are the viral particles, um, which, are, which have been vitrified, so very rapidly frozen uh, to avoid formation of crystalline ice, but just the ice will uh, stop in an amorphous state. And um, on the top, you see the, the, the carbon foil, uh, which is the support of the EM grid. And these dense uh, beads are gold fiducias that we use for alignments. But from one image of a pleomorphic virus, you cannot get any three-dimensional information. Those are can be assimilated to projection images. So the only way to get 3D information out of pleomorphic um, uh, objects is to acquire a TILT series. And the TILT series consists of uh, a series of images uh, acquired at different tilt angles of the stage within the microscope. So within the transmission electron microscope, you tilt your sample and you acquire every two or three degrees uh, a new image. The tilt series then can be, um, of course, post processed and, and then used to reconstruct computationally the tomogram. And down below, you see the, the, the 3D model, the, the, this map, uh, which, um, which represents our reconstructed objects of interest. And in this case, it was HIV particles in the mature form, where you see the spherical membrane, the envelope, 
uh, inside of that you might appreciate already at the ultrastructural level these conical uh, shapes of the of the capsids and this dense um, blob inside which is the the RNA uh, genome so now we are able with cryo ET to to have um, a detailed uh, understanding of the ultrastructure of the viruses but um, we can use this technique to to answer some questions and and the first one is how are these cones formed so how what what is the um, the driver that uh, nucleates the assembly of the core, and why do we have uh, conical cores uh, morphology uh, uh, eventually? So we we wanted to do morphology analysis on uh, by cryoelectron tomography on HIV one mutants uh, in in the hope to to shed in light on 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 what was this nucleation event and and how the conical um, core formation would proceed and. If we look at the uh, the gag proteolytic processing that leads from an immature particle to a mature particle, uh, we know that the uh, protease will cleave the five different uh, sites on gag at different speeds. The, the the fastest site is 400 times faster than the uh, than the slower cuts, and this leads first to the release of the nucleocapsid domain, which was binding, as I told you, the the genome. So. The hypothesis is that the genome is the first thing to condense in a um, particle that under, undergoes maturation. And since the role of the capsid is the one to protect the genome that will travel in the cytoplasm of a newly infected cell while being retrotranscribed, um, it was somewhat um, you know, intriguing to uh, <laughs> or attempting to, to postulate that it is the the genome that drives the nucleation and the assembly of the conical capsid around itself. So we wanted to investigate this hypothesis, and, and we did so by producing HIV mutants based on, on former um, work of other labs that would uh, still lead to the assembly of, of the immature uh, Gagalactis, uh, but this time um, where the nucleocapsid domain was exchanged by a leucine zipper domain. So the leucine zipper domain was still able to provide um, uh, dimerization contacts that would stabilize the, the gag lattice to form uh, a proper immature particle. But at the same time, it doesn't bind uh, any RNA, nor cellular, uh, neither cellular nor uh, the viral RNA. And we could prove this um, at the biochemical level, where you see that the, the wild type particles uh, that run on a, uh, on a gradient, they do contain uh, genome copies or, in general, also um, RNA, while the leucine zipper mutant, the, they, they do not bind uh, any RNA. So we were able to produce um, um, my, um, immature particles that could uh, be cleaved by the protease and therefore could show us how um, the genome affected the formation of, of the core. And this is the, the cryo-electron tomography morphological analysis where you see wild type viruses as i showed you before and here you see the the counterpart of the leucine zipper mutant so at the morphological level you see that some mutants do show uh, the immature morphology so it means that here the protease uh, might have not been pre present or might not have uh, undergone the activation process but surprisingly really um, what we see is that the capsid protein after cleavage, despite the absence of, of any RNA, was still able to assemble into regular cores, um, often uh, with altered morphology. So they, they weren't all conical or cylindrical like in the wild type, but still they were of the right size and, uh, and, and similar morphology and they were closed uh, uh, cores. So, we also have seen a, a, an increased number of uh, aberrant, uh, aberrant morphologies, but to our big surprise, the genome is not uh, the viral component that is needed for the nucleation and that drives then the assembly of the core. So to date, we still do not have a clear answer um, of, of what is the mechanism uh, that drives the conical core formation, but I just wanted to give you, you know, a first example of how you can use simple cryo-electron tomography without much further processing to, to already answer some of, 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 these, of these questions. But the next one is, uh, okay, um, fine. We, we don't know how they are, they are being formed, but uh, we know that they are there and, and 
what is the structure of HIV conjugal cores within bar, uh, native viral particles? So in this case, we, we went ahead and employed still cardiovascular tomography, but then I'm pushing uh, the, the processing to do in situ high resolution structural analysis. And here we were working with wild type HIV uh, variants. So what was known at the time about the, the, the conjugal cores in terms of structural uh, information? Well, it was um, postulated in, in 1999 uh, that the, a model that would um, resemble well the conical shapes that were observed uh, by cryo-EM uh, well, or electron microscopy in general was the fuller, fuller ring model. In a fuller ring structure, you have a lattice of hexagons, which is closed by the insertion of 12 pentamers. And the distribution of the pentamers uh, will lead to different shapes. And in the case of HIV, you, can, you could get a fuller ring cone by inserting five uh, um, pentamers at the tip and seven pentamers at the bottom. And if you think, oh, what, what is this fullering model? Well, I'm sure you're very familiar with one fullering model, which is just the old school football uh, ball, in which you have the 12 pentamers that are uh, evenly distributed with a minimal number of, uh, of hexamers. So if you put more, you can put as many hexamers as you like, and as long as you have 12 pentamers, uh, either defects or insertion, you, you will be able to close the lattice. And how about the building blocks? So, well, it was shown that capsid protein after cleavage is able to crystallize as hexameric lattice, uh, by, and, and this was work done by X-ray crystallography. And, and, and a, a group also showed that by cross-linking capsids in, in the positions that were uh, present in the, in the hexamers, you could also get crystals of uh, capsid pentamers. And, and this was showing that the two subunits, the hexamers and the pentamers, were uh, stabilized by the same contacts and they were quasi equivalent uh, with very small um, changes in terms of rel relative orientation of the protomers. And finally, there were um, cryo-EM studies on in vitro assembled uh, capsids. So this was done by cryo-EM, single, uh, sorry, helical reconstruction, uh, where the capsid hexamers were shown to assemble in, in these tubes. And, and all this information was then put together to form a fuller in assembly uh, with molecular dynamics models. However, um, you know, a lot was known, but those were uh, all um, um, pieces of information uh, obtained by different techniques and that needed to be validated within real uh, viruses. And to do so, we applied uh, the technique called subtomogram averaging. So subtomogram averaging is a workflow that allows you to get high resolution structures of a repeating unit within your tomogram. So in your 3D reconstruction, you might find your object of interest repeated multiple times. And in this case was the hexamer capsid assemblies uh, along the conical core. If you are able to extract those repeating units, you can align them to a reference and you know, by having a large number of noisy particles aligned to the same reference, you are able to increase the signal to noise ratio, have a better reference that you can iteratively align again to your particles until you converge to a consensus structure that shows you the best reconstruction you can get from, from your data. So let me give you a real example of that. Uh, ah, yeah, and just to mention, that was 2015, 2016. Our group, John Briggs group, was uh, really pioneering high resolution tomography. And we were uh, the first ones being able to get, um, in this case is the um, um, work of my colleague Florian Schur, uh, to get sub nanometer structure. So where you could really fit secondary structure elements, alpha indices of, of your sub tomogram uh, averaging map. So the, the workflow starts with, with your tomogram. And as I told you, the first thing is you should be able to identify your repeating units. And in our case, we were quite fortunate. Our capsid hexamers were repeating along the, the conical cores. So we could, I, I did manually render it, 552 cores. And, and along the, these rendered surfaces, I could define uh, random extraction points. And those extraction points are iteratively aligned to converge to hexameric positions that will eventually uh, give you the, the, the orientation and the quality of alignment here, the color code is green and, you know, a particle that is being properly aligned 
and uh, orange uh, red particle that has been poorly aligned. And all those hexamers placed now in the tomogram shows for you the orientation and, and quality of the alignment of, of each individual particle you have, you have extracted and processed. But you know the, the, the goal was to get the, the reconstruction, so the EM map uh, of this uh, of this um, capsule assembly, and this is what we what we did in in gray um, in transparency. You see the 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 EM map obtained by some tomogram averaging reconstruction, and inside you see the PDB model fitted from X-ray a rigid body fitted by by the X-ray crystallography structure. So you see the the capsule domain. Um, sorry, the capsid protein has two domains, the N-terminal and the C-terminal. So N-terminal here in blue and in red for one prodromal. And you see that they assemble um, by um, having N-terminal domains uh, that stabilize uh, the assembly of the hexamer itself and the C-terminal domains here in orange that stabilize the con connection and interaction with neighboring hexamers. So again, this was very exciting because we were able to prove the actual structure of, uh, of our assembly directly within var particles that yes, they were uh, you know, purified and, and, and prepared as a grid, but they were intact, uh, intact infectious videos, videos uh, that were not um, uh, modified in any other way. But as I tried to anticipate to you in the slide before, it's great to get some, some sub nanometer maps in which you can fit your protein and describe at the molecular level the interaction but the amazing thing about subtomogram averaging is not only you get the map, but you get the position of each individual unit that you have online. So you really get the position in, in the X, Y, Z and their orientation with all your angles of each the hexamers within the conical core. And then you can start to do all sorts of analysis. And in this case, we were, uh, we were wondering how does the capsule lattice accommodate the different curvature that you need to um, to have to form closed uh, fullerene cores. And therefore, we were trying to understand how two neighboring hexamers uh, were relating to each other in terms of uh, tilt angle and, and, and twist angle. So with geometrical analysis of, of this pair um, of hexamers that, um, you know, thousands of pairs of hexamers we, we had online, I could, for example, show you how in, in a longitudinal view of the hexamer uh, lattice, you see each bump is a hexamer, um, I can increase the tilt angle and get reconstructions that are uh, you know, um, showing a greater and greater curvature. And, and those structures can be put together in, in, in movies showing you how the interfaces between uh, two uh, neighboring hexamers, so this would be one hexamer and this is the next one, and this is the C-terminal domains that stabilize their interaction, how this interaction changes based on the different conformation of, of neighboring hexamers. And not only you get this, you know, in this case, I, I got 21 different structures um, showing how the lattice was, uh, was being, um, uh, was accommodating the different curvatures, but you can also place them back in 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 space and and show how this curvature is distributed within uh, the conical core. So you see here in red, uh, we have regions with high curvature, so high tilt angle, and in blue, uh, low tilt angle because it's a relatively flat region. And you can then uh, show within each capsid monomer uh, how the curvature is accommodated within a prodomer, so how the N-terminal domain moves with respect to the C-terminal domain, but also you can define how this curvature is accommodated between neighboring hexamers at this trimeric and dimeric interface, which I'm showing, uh, I'm showing here. And why is that important? Well, because the crystal structures that were available from HIV and different uh, retrovirus assemblies and molecular dynamic simulations um, um, foreseen very large movements of these interfaces and, and based on the different crystal um, packing or the different uh, outcome of the, of the simulations. However, when you look within real viruses, you see that those interfaces, the American and Trameric interface that stabilize the hexameric lattice are actually very, very fine and, and you know, smooth movements uh, that, that are able to accommodate this great variability within um, the, the HIV uh, curvature. So 
this is why it's important to look at things in situ. And another thing was, okay, it really looks like uh, from our result, we confirmed that the conical cores are fully ring modes. However, we said we need 12 pentamers to close a fully ring core. Um, and we could see that where there were positions in which five hexamers were arranged around a pentameric um, coordinated position. However, you can have a, pen, uh, a fuller in core either by missing uh, capsid proteins in, in this region, it could be an empty spot, or you could actually have the, the pentamer. Uh, I, remember, uh, I would like to remind you that the pentamer structure was obtained by artificially cross-linking five you know, the five capsid pentamers to, to uh, capsid protomers to, to form a pentamer. So again, by taking advantage of the positions on, of the geometry information you get by subtomogram averaging, what I did was to identify all these pentamerically coordinated positions within my big data set and just average them without any further information. I just found all of them and then said, okay, now you, you make an average of those. And by the average, we already got out of the box, the, the pentameric structure. So this didn't come from any iterative alignment at this stage. And we could really see uh, those are ortho slices of the density, while here is the, the representation of the surface. We, we could really see the um, uh, density of a pentamer uh, subunit surrounded by the five hexamers, which are then part of this hexameric lattice. And it's quite obvious how um, this lattice was highly curved. So this is the first map just out of averaging of all the found positions with geometry. Of course, you can uh, do iterative alignment as we did for the hexamer to improve the resolution. I mean, of course, we have much less um, um, uh, pentamers than hexamers, so the resolution was still sub nanometer but uh, lower than, than before. Good enough to do uh, rigid body fitting of, of and, and then um, uh, um, uh, and then simulations to 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 fit uh, flexibly within the map the the protomers and and like before you see the the, the capsid pentamers is is really able to form uh, sorry the capsid uh, protein is really able to form this uh, this pentamers and um, as as I was sh showing before I'm not sure what's happening here um, but um, but the the pentamers are always sitting. In, in these highly curved uh, regions. And, and even within the density of the tomogram, you can see uh, their position. So, um, and then one could ask, well, you know, but we already had the, the structure uh, of the pentamer by uh, cross-link X-ray uh, analysis. Well, not really. We see that the cross-link pentamer shows a, a protomer-protomer interface, which is pretty much identical to the X-mer. And this is not surprising. The cross-linking uh, linking was induced based on positions that were found at, by the XMR-XMR interface. But the in situ pentamer shows you that, yes, indeed, they are quasi equivalent because overall the arrangement is still the same. The N-terminal domains are interacting to form, uh, to stabilize the pentamer. But the interaction interface, which is formed, is quite different. And what is very interesting is that what I depict here in gray is the pocket of one uh, uh, retroviral inhibitor. So you, you see that the inhibitor will bind in a hexamer in a pocket, which is com you know closed in, a, in the hexamer, while it's completely opened up in the pentamer, meaning that hexamers and pentamers can respond differently to inhibitors and, and most likely also cellular factor involved in, in the life cycle of, of the cell. And here you see like that this, this difference, in, difference in conformation is, is, uh, is quite uh, traumatic between the inverse hexamer and pentamer. And finally, you know, yes, we, we did show that uh, we, we could get the full ring model of this course, but then we, we started to evaluate uh, how complete they were. And I think it was a bit surprising to see that 99% of them were actually, to some extent, damaged. They were not complete, uh, fully closed structures. And I cannot exclude that this comes from um, damages that occurring during the purification process, or this could simply be a low efficiency of, of you know, the, the, the viral uh, reproduction uh, maturation process that leads to a, a vast number of particles that are actually not fully complete. But the completeness somewhat 
was always uh, hypothesized to be um, important for for uh, protecting the viral genome from uh, cellular responses after infections. In the end, you are exposing viral RNA and then the retrotranscribed DNA to the cytoplasm of a cell. So it was always um, foreseen that we, you should have complete structures. And we did find them. So six out of the 552 cores were indeed complete uh, fullerene cores. And I'm showing here the, the tomogram peak reconstruction and then and then the model where you can see all the excimers and pentamers. And I think you can you can see that uh, the distribution of the pentamers also drives the different morphology. So you the three top ones are three standard uh, cones where you have five pentamers at the top and, and uh, seven at the bottom. But if you have six and six, you get this cylindrical structure. And if the distribution of the pentamer is more uh, random, you get this polyhedral uh, distribution. So we finally have a, a structural understanding of how HIV cores look like in, in, in real uh, variants. But then the next question is, OK, the genome is correct. Yeah, I don't know if you can. I can't. I have a question for you. But I don't know if you sure. want to interrupt your. Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, this is a super fascinating. Um, I, I wonder if from the incomplete structures you can get a hint of how this thing is assembled. Because I'm I'm wondering how you would assemble such a fullerene, right? You are there penta is are the pentamers missing, or what do you think? Can you speculate what you'd want to form first? Yeah, actually, uh, this is again a very debated uh, topic. We we have. Uh, cores that are missing the bottom part, we have cores that are missing the tip, and there is no obvious, um, you know, information you can you can get to to that hints you to one way of assembly. So the only thing I, I think in the interest of time I couldn't show you the only thing we can do is to try to synchronize the maturation process and see how uh, the progression of of the conical core formation happens. But again, this is a very tricky mechanism. The protease activation, we still don't understand exactly and when it happens and, and the dynamics of it. And as soon as we try to fiddle around with it by using protease inhibitors and removing them, we mess up the system. So unfortunately, neither from this data, from you know wild type particles, nor from other experiments, I, I can point you to later on, there is a clear answer on how this is formed. Yeah, this is something I would really like to know, but maybe in a few years. All right. Um, so how is then the genome delivered uh, to the nucleus of infected cells? And what I'm showing now is um, um, a cryoplan workflow uh, to observe HIV-1 cores within the infected cells traveling to the nucleus uh, by in situ cryoelectron tomography. And and I really have to stress that uh, sorry um, that this um, yeah that they were you know what were the hypotheses uh, so the, the hypothesis were well you release the conical core into the cytoplasm of the of the cell and either you have an immediate encoding of of the um, of the capsid and then replication exposed to the cytoplasm, which is a bit unrealistic because again there will be many structural and uh, many cellular responses being triggered or the genome is still protected to some extent, but the core needs to disassemble uh, at least partially. Or finally, the core docks on the, onto the nuclear pore, and then the tip will disassemble to let the viral genome, which has been retrotranscribed, we know that the retrotranscription happens during the traveling to the core, uh, to the nucleus, um, um, but you know, the, the core will dock and release the retrotranscribed gene. So all models, as you can see, demand that the conical core will disassemble at a certain point because the structure of the nuclear pore that was solved by some, you know, multiple labs, including Martin Beck at the MBL at the time, uh, was too small, 40 nanometers, to, to allow the conical core to travel through it because the, the broad end of the conical core is roughly 50, 60 nanometers. So it was, um, you know, it was clear from the structures that it was impossible for the core to travel uh, uh, across the nuclear core. So what I'm showing here is a project where I was very marginally involved, but the project was driven by Martin Beck, uh, 
the time here in uh, TMBL, now Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, and again, Professor Preussley. So there are two teams joined to, um, to try to do the first in situ analysis of, of a core traveling uh, to the nucleus. And I, I guess now it's time to introduce um, the method cryocorrelative light and electron microscopy. With this method, uh, we want to combine the functional and specific information you get from light microscopy with the ultrastructure and structural information you get from uh, EM. And we do that by freezing our specimen, in this case, infected uh, cell lines, uh, doing light microscopy on them, and then targeting the region of interest with feed milling. Because if you want to do cryo-electron tomography, as I showed you before, your specimen has to be thin thinner than 400 nanometers. And eukaryotic cells are thicker than that. And they're usually a few microns thick. So they will look like totally black because the electrons are not able to go through, through the material. So you have to artificially thin them down to form this thin uh, lamella, we call it. So this thin window in the cell. And you do this by film milling. Uh, using uh, FIPSEM, so scanning electron microscopy combined with focus ion beam milling, where gallium ions are used to remove biological material from the top and the bottom of, of the cell to then just leave this uh, thin central slice. And this slice is now, the lamella is electron transparent. Uh, you can image it with transmission microscopy and you can acquire a tomogram of the cellular environment. Uh, you can also do light microscopy a posteriori after milling to make sure that your signal of interest is retained in the, in the lamella. And of course, you can correlate uh, the two data to find within the lamella the region of interest and then acquire tomograms only where, uh, where you, you have your, um, your process happening. And those are just life, um, you know, real life examples of, of the technique. This is a cryo light microscopy, can be usually wide field or confocal microscopy. Now there are some developments in terms of cryo super resolution microscopy, but still not widely um, applicable. Uh, Film milling to remove the bottom and the, uh, um, the bottom and the top part of a cell and just leave this thin cell, uh, thin lamella, which seen from the top in a transmission electron microscopy looks like that. And on that, you can correlate the light microscopy data to find, for example, the region of interest, zoom in and acquire a uh, atomogram. And you might ask, oh, well, why, why do we need um, light microscopy? Can't we just open up the cell, make a lamella and get a tomogram? there yes uh, you can i mean this is the outcome you here is the the tomographic reconstruction of a region within uh, the infected cell and i can tell you that here i see uh, the nuclear envelope with a nuclear pore and a conical capsid core that has traveled along a macrotubule approaching the, the pore and i think you know if you might have a hard time uh, believing me but if we do segmentation right you you can really see that you see the nuclear envelope the pore uh, in, in, in this light blue and in, in purple, the, the conical core traveling along a red microtubule uh, approaching the nuclear pore. So the cellular, just to say that the cellular environment is very complex. It's, um, tomograms are noisy. It's very hard to find these unique events in a cell. Those, those events are, are very rare. So you need light microscopy data to point you in that direction. And, CLAM workflows are, are quite complicated. And, and in this case, uh, Martin and Hans Georg uh, labs started with, um, with plastic uh, EM, where they, they first were embedding the cells into, before moving to cryo workflows, they were embedding them into resin and using light microscopy to, to find one single event of this uh, conical core here labeled in, in, in red, in the red channel. Um, within an infected cell. And then when you could find those individual events uh, among your, your cells on the grid, then you could zoom in and do tomography. And, and this tomography data showed that actually the conical cores were indeed capable of going through the nuclear pore. So approaching them and, and traveling across. There were some, you know, a number of instances of, 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 this, uh, of these events. And I just told you that in principle, that was not possible. Well, the amazing thing is that the structure of the nuclear pore complexes were obtained after isolation of the nuclear pore. And the nu nuclear pore, therefore, was in a state 
which would result in roughly 40 nanometers of diameter. But when you get the structure of the pore in living cells, then the, the, the structure of the pore is very dynamic and can be open to 65 uh, nanometers or so. And this is then, you see, um, you know, beautiful work from Martin Beck and Jan Koczynski showing uh, how the nuclear pore complex can accommodate very different morphologies and, and based on the metabolic, metabolic state of the cell, uh, change dramatically the, the, the size of, of its pore. And, and therefore, you know, in living cells, when infected, the, the conical core indeed is capable of crossing uh, the nuclear pore and then only after crossing, releasing the genome. And this makes much more sense because you, are, you need to protect the viral genome uh, in the cytoplasm from uh, cellular responses against infection. And this is, of course, the most effective way to keep the conical core intact until the, the barrier of the nuclear envelope has been, uh, has been crossed. All right. So that was the end of the journey of, of HIV. And I think we are mm, you know, running a bit out of time, but I, I just want to give you a glimpse of cellular structure biology, how, can, how we use it nowadays um, to, to, uh, to answer yeah, you know, new questions. And I mean, I, I guess I don't need to introduce much the my, mitochondria, uh, but you know, just to say that mitochondria are you know, cellular signaling hubs. Uh, most of their proteins are nuclearly encoded and need to be imported um, uh, from the cytoplasm, and only 1% are synthesized from, um, from the genome of the mitochondria. Um, so there must be an extensive uh, protein targeting and translocation machinery to to make this happen and we wanted to in, uh, we wanted to study and investigate these um, uh, processes and we did this in collaboration with the yoma lab at the university of virginia and here you see all the people involved and as i <laughs> told you just yesterday we put our biochive preprint uh, online so if today i won't have time to to show you all the details please have a look um, or, or just you know come back to me and we did this targeting uh, of mitochondrial proteins. Uh, we started to study that in S. pombe, Schizosaccharomyces pombe, also known as fish and yeast, uh, because um, we wanted to really have uh, an easy model to understand um, whether the, the, the two mechanisms that have been proposed were the only ones that were actually happening. So uh, for the ER, uh, you, you you have co-translation and translocation of your proteins into the ER lumen by the ribosomes that is uh, brought to the ER by the single recognition particle, SRP. Um, while for mitochondrial protein, the main um, model was that mitochondrial proteins are translated in the cytoplasm and post-translation chaperons, chaperons will bring it to the translocation machineries that will then deliver the protein to either the outer membrane, the intermembrane space, the inner membrane, or the matrix of, of the mitochondria. However, in fission yeast, uh, it was shown that um, like we have ER-bound uh, microscope, uh, ER-bound ER ribosomes, so you see the, in the ribosomes bound to the ER membrane in cryo-ET data from Yule Mohamed and Yudit Zhao here at EMBL. We also have some mitochondrial-bound uh, uh, ribosomes, so ribosomes that bind the outer membrane of the mitochondria. And then in an older study, it was shown that in Pombe, if you were starving it by um, depleting glucose after seven days of starvation, the mitochondria were getting um, decorated with ribosomes that were apparently sequestered at the outer membrane. So we, we took this uh, system and we tried to replicate this condition in, in, in cryo. So the cryo workflow is easy. You take the Pombe cells, uh, you, you grow them first in, in rich medium, and then you split them in, in the fine medium where you add glucose uh, at 2% volume uh, to volume to volume or 0.5%. And then you, in low glucose, you can have them starving. And after starvation, you do plunge freezing, feed milling, and carry electron tomography, as I showed you before. So this is a, an image of a scanning electron microscopy image of vitrified cells. So those are pombe cells uh, placed on an EM grid after starvation. We can open them up uh, by film milling and making a nice lamella and within the lamella acquiring a tomogram. And I hope you can appreciate that indeed we were able to replicate the result in, in cryo. We see the, the mitochondrion, uh, which is fragmented, spherical, so reduced in size and then fully decorated with ribosomes. 
And we, we wanted to understand what we, was the translational level, because our idea was, well, maybe the, the ribosomes here are actively translating and translocating mitochondrial proteins that are needed um, and that are needed for uh, for the cell to survive the starvation condition. But if we look at, at um, a protein translation by ribosome profilings, uh, here you see a happy cell where you have the 40S and 60S uh, subunits of the ribosome that can assemble into ITS to translate um, messenger RNAs into proteins. And ribosomes usually do that in a chain called polysomes. So many ribosomes are on the same messenger RNA translating the same protein. And, and you see that if you run these things in a gradient, you, you will have the two subunits, then the ADS ribosomes, and then the polysomes. So all the peaks of two, three, four, five uh, ribosomes translating the same messenger RNA. If you do that after starvation, you see that actually in here in red, translation is gone. So in we have all this ribosome decoration, but actually there is no uh, detectable translation uh, going on in the cell. So we first wanted to understand how hard those ribosomes inhibited under nutrient depleted conditions. So we removed glucose, uh, translation stops, but how does that happen? And to do so, we purified ribosomes and we did cayenne structures to investigate at high resolution uh, uh, how they looked. And for those of you that are not familiar with cayenne single particle analysis, I guess most of you by now are, but it's um, relatively easy workflows by now. You have your purified ribosomes, you prepare them by punch freezing on EM grids, so you vitrify very thin layers on, on, on this uh, EM support grid. And this is one microcraft that shows you your thousands of ribosomes um, that are more or less all, all identical, being um, uh, vitrified within a thin layer of ice. You can get high resolution reconstructions by processing the data that you can then use to, uh, to thin, thin um, uh, models and, and you know, uh, assess the, the, at the structural level the, the mechanisms you are investigating. So we did that. Uh, to analyze both the ribosomes isolated from high glucose and low glucose um, condition. And we could see that the actively translating ribosomes had the tRNA in the P site, meaning you know, translation is happening, a protein is being uh, produced. And this is the standard position of our uh, helix 69 of, of the ribosome RNA. But you see that in glu low glucose, the ribosomes are not translating. There is no presence of tRNA. Uh, here you see that this density is missing. And the helix 69 here depicted in red has changed its conformation. So EM maps you know, give us really the possibility to build these detailed models that then can tell us the molecular mechanism of, for example, inhibition of protein translation in, in this specific condition. And this was a mechanism that was not uh, described uh, before uh, for the ribosomes. But then the question is, okay, they are they're inhibited uh, clearly, but how are they sequestered at the outer mitochondrial membrane? So for, to answer that, we used in situ cryoty to determine the structure and orientation of, of these ribosomes uh, after glucose deposition. And this workflow is, is the same as I showed you. you. You grow the cells, you freeze them, you do thin milling, and then you acquire tomograms in that. And this is how it looks like. So you have your lamella, uh, in the transmission electron microscope, you can get a low resolution magnification, uh, sorry, a low magnification map of your lamella where you have sections of all the cells. And then you can target uh, the position where you find um, the decorated mitochondria and you can get a gallery of all those events. So you can compare um, these conditions with, um, uh, you know, in, while being depleted or if the cells are growing in, in rich media. And you see that happy cells uh, have elongated mitochondria, which have very little or no ribosomes uh, in, in the proximity of the other mitochondria membrane. While if you, if you starve them after four days, the mitochondria gets fragmented and at seven days, it's fully decorated with, with ribosomes. So we went ahead and we applied high resolution subtomogram averaging to get the structure and orientation of those ribosomes. And we could see that indeed the ribosomes were in a hibernating state. Uh, there is no tRNA, no messenger RNA, and we have the EAF2 factor that is indicated that indeed those ribosomes are, those ADS ribosomes are just locked and they're not uh, translating. And you even see the, the faint density of the outer membrane to which they, they are connected. 
But the surprising thing really, apart from the structure, is that those ribosomes were really fully decorated in the mitochondrion and they were all upside down compared to what we expected. Usually ribosomes bind the, the membranes with their large subunit because the large subunit has the exit tunnel where the protein you know, comes out and might be translocated while being translated. Here, the ribosomes were all upside down with the small subunit contacting the outer mitochondrial membrane. And this is an example of how different the orientation is compared to translating ribosomes that are co-translationally translocating um, proteins into the ER uh, compared to what we observe. And not only they were, uh, you know, all bound, but in, in this video, you can, you can see how they are fully decorated in the mitochondrion, but at the same time, they form oligomeric assemblies. And at this stage, I don't know if this assembly uh, is any way functional, uh, but um, it might simply happen because they are tightly packed and they you know, um, self-assemble into pentameric, tetrameric, or uh, trimeric uh, assemblies. And here you see with the lights, um, you, know, you can identify the different assembly, um, assembly states. So we don't know at this stage if this is an functional, but, um, you know, this is the, uh, you know, the first time we observe uh, oligomeric assemblies at the membrane, and those um, assemblies are stabilized by, if you, if you take two neighboring uh, ribosomes, are stabilized by an interaction interface that, again, was not described before for two ribosomes, two neighboring ribosomes contacting to each other. So we have structures of colliding ribosomes in in um, bacterial and, and human cells, uh, which are quite uh, you know similar, where the two small subunits are mainly in contact with each other. Uh, but you see here that the interaction interface we we have in our in our sample is is quite different. And then finally, we we could fit the model of the um, the high resolution model obtained with single particle analysis into the tomography uh, subtomogram imaging maps. Uh, which are at lower resolution, roughly 11 angstrom, and we could identify that the closest thing to the membrane is actually a protein called RAC1. So we, we wanted to investigate whether RAC1 was indeed um, the protein um, responsible for the tethering of the ribosome. So we made mutants where we deleted RAC1, and you could see that now ribosomes, after seven days of glucose depletion, they're still fragmented and small, but they are both. They have no ribosomes bound. And I mean, in, the, in this video, you can uh, pretty much see the rendering where you, you also have the position and, and orientation of all the ribosomes that are now distributed in, in, into the cytoplasm. And finally, we also wanted to understand whether um, this, since the, it's con uh, sequential, right? You have first fragmentation and then uh, tethering of the ribosomes. We, we made a mutant of dynamine one where, um, you know, we inhibit the fragmentation process. So we have this large, um, large mitochondria which cannot form these small fragmented uh, spheres, but the binding is not affected. So you see that the mitochondria are still fully uh, decor uh, decorated by, by the ribosomes in, in the same fashion. So it's still very early stages, hard to know what's going on, but basically uh, we, we, we see that when we starve cells, um, um, so in nutrient depletion uh, conditions, and we stress their, um, um, their state, uh, their environment, the, the response is, fragmentation of, of the mitochondria, uh, carpeting of the other membrane with um, inhibited uh, ribosomes. And this could be a storage form of, of those uh, complexes, which are, of course, very costly to produce. And you might want them readily available when energy uh, will come back, uh, if uh, the energy source uh, is, is given again. And I mean, the tethering uh, are, uh, at the mitochondria might favor protein translation of mitochondria proteins uh, when energy is restored, so they are you know, nicely placed uh, in, in space, or the tethering might also have signaling mechanisms that might have the survival of the cell, um, uh, promoting uh, persistence by inhibiting apoptosis uh, initiation. But this is very speculative, is, is at the very early stages, and, and of course, we need further investigation to answer that. And finally, um, I would like you know, to acknowledge everyone that worked on, on, on the two projects, especially John, Martin, and Hans Georg for, for all the HIV stories I, I, I showed you today, and my team and our collaborator, 
Yoma Lab for um, for the fantastic work on on Comet. Thank you, and sorry for being a bit over time. Thank you very much, Simone. Wonderful talk. Um, are there any questions from the audience, either at Chenille or at Amber? Please raise your hand. Um, <clears throat> I have a quick, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm smart. Um, quick question. I, I saw that you had some structure from the outer nuclear membrane. And I'm wondering if you have enough there to distinguish um, lipid composition or whether there's any other trans membrane proteins integrated at that interface. Yes, so, I mean, here, this is purely a model, right? So the membrane is just a, a sketch. <laughs> we have no information uh, whatsoever, but apart from very, um, you know, this is very noisy and, and, and unfeatured um, um, density. So you, there is no, nothing at the structure level we can say. And honestly, we cannot even see the link. So of course there must be a receptor in the outer mitochondrial membrane for sure. Uh, we don't know that binds to RAC1, but we couldn't find any density. And now we are trying with, you know, with mass spec and live cell imaging to understand what are the, the candidates that could uh, play a role. But with this technique, with current electron tomography, for sure you have no information whatsoever about the membrane composition. And if the interaction is flexible like this, in this case, you also cannot visualize the, the, the binding partner. Any, any further questions? If not, I, I, had, a, I had a question, you know, um, Simon, you you outlined uh, um, nicely why you need sort of cor correlative, you know, fluorescence, um, cryo electron tomography workflows, but I also realized that much of the, probably the earlier work, right, was not done using any of this additional information you had to guide your, um, your sort of your image acquisition so I was wondering, was it was it just that basically the HIV virus was just so abundant in the samples that you could basically just cut it almost anywhere and you would get a, a decent chunk of, of viruses? Okay. So the imaging or this, was something that was work, If you're referring to this part of, of the presentation, here HIV particles have been purified from the um, from the medium of infected cells. So you oh, have yes. cells growing, you infect them, they produce the virions, they release them into the uh, supernatant, you, you, you get the medium, you centrifuge, do I think multiple ultra centrifugation steps to isolate and concentrate the virions, which are intact. Here you don't do uh, thin milling because the virions are roughly mm -hmm. um, 150 nanometer in, in diameter, so they're thin enough to be imaged as they are in their entirety. Uh, okay. Um, so and I you, guess it's that they are abundant enough that you would yes, always. Yes, exactly. So here you you will find many particles in a in a grid. It depends on how much uh, how much virions you've collected from the medium uh, of of infected cells and and your purification strategy. On the other side, when you when you look at things uh, in situ, yeah, those events are very rare. I mean, and and that's why you you really need to use CLEM because otherwise brute force might lead you to, to have one event out of, you know, maybe 50 cells you're, you're looking at, so. No and, Thanks for clarifying. Yeah, and of course, I mean, for example, in, in the in, in the last part of the talk, I, I didn't, I, we didn't use uh, light microscopy to, to guide our acquisitions because uh, uh, even from these low magnification maps, if you zoom in, you can already identify uh, those events, but I mean, they are visually in clear. Of course, if we now want to do functional studies, maybe uh, we, you you have um, labeling strategies that allow you to identify when the ribosomes bind or when they leave, if you restore energy, and then of course you can use the light microscope information to to really um, aim for for those uh, for those events. Again, getting the functional information from light microscopy. Thank you very much. Maybe we have time for one one more question. Or... Uh, I have a question. Um, I see one very nice talk. Thanks. Um, so I was wondering about the 
the oligomers that you found on the surface of the mitochondria. So uh, is it so it's is that based on many mitochondria that you imaged? And I'm wondering, like, is the dense is it because do, um, is it is it uh, does it form oligomers because it's very densely packed on the surface, or is there uh, definitely like um, a difference to a random orientation of the oligomers? Yeah. Honestly, so the, the pentamers you, or this trimer tetramer pentamers arrangement you can find on all um, decorated mitochondria. So this is not you know, one single case. Um, but I believe it's mainly because they are so densely packed along the mitochondrial membrane that they will start to interact with each other. And most likely, this is the most favored uh, interaction interface between the two of them. I, at the moment, there is no evidence um, that this interaction is functional. I mean, it could, you know, maybe it could increase the local concentration of the receptor at the other membrane that would trigger some signaling. I doubt so. I, I honestly think at this stage they're, they're purely interacting because they're so close to each other. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. How, however, this interaction might change based on 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 the curvature. So you we see more pentamers in the round uh, spherical fragmented um, samples than uh, here. Let me, let me, oh. Does this? Okay. Yeah. If you if you look at this one where the the, the mutant is not spherical but it's elongated, uh, then you have really the same kind of density. But it's a bit less common to find, for example, the pentamers. They're they're mm -hmm. sometimes more arranged into into rows. But it seems mm -hmm. like they follow the the curvature of, of the mitochondria. So I I really think it's mainly just steric interactions. Could you do like a nearest neighbor distance analysis or like a yes. simulation of what? Uh, but I mean, we can do really dive into um, you know this conformation analysis. But I, again. We didn't put any. We didn't put much uh, effort there, simply because there is at the moment no indication that this might be functional. So we focused yes. on other things. But uh, I mean, this kind of interaction. So this is not an EMR. This is obtained by uh, yeah the nearest neighbors and then the transformation of all their angles into quaternions and and basically averaging the relative orientation of two neighboring particles. So mm -hmm. this is a model of how they interact. Okay, got it. Thank you. Great, so I, I don't see any further questions and uh, I think you already passed the hour, but thank you very much, Simone, once again, a really fantastic talk. Uh, thanks for sort of sharing with us your, your research. Thank you very much. <laughs> thanks a lot, Robert, thanks everyone.